Okay, so does everyone have does everyone have a little booklet with the pictures? Okay. And you've seen these pictures, I've kind of showed you them, but we're gonna spend some time talking about we're gonna get real deep into what each picture represents. Um, and it's important that you understand, I was talking with Mary about this, about how there's uh, lots of churches that they take uh, the worship of God and they want to worship things that we touch and we see and can hold on to. So we have idols. I mean, since the beginning of creation, God you know, gave the Ten Commandments. Do not make any graven image and bow down and worship them. Okay? So it's very important we understand, like with this, when we look at a picture, the picture is supposed to point us to something greater. There's nothing powerful in a picture, okay, in itself. So, But what many people have done is they've taken symbols like the cross, you see this especially here in this country with the uh, the Orthodox people. They make the sign of the cross. You know, I'll, I'm probably doing it the wrong way, but they see a church and they think somehow that that has some sort of power in itself, or they wear the necklace and uh, <laughs> you know they think, oh, this will keep the evil spirits away or something. There's nothing powerful in the actual cross itself. It's what it points to and represents. So these pictures here point all to Jesus and the gospel and help us understand it better. Okay, so my goal for this summer to focus on is how do we take the good news of Jesus and explain it to other people? Because I know many of you, you have family members who do not know Jesus. And you probably, I'm sure you've been praying for them and you've been trying to think, how can I talk to them and explain it? You know Jesus yourself, but sometimes it's hard to explain and tell other people. I remember when I was young, I accepted Jesus when I was a little boy at six years old. And I truly put my trust in Him. But I did not really know how to help other people become a Christian. I mean, I, I could tell them believe in Jesus, but I needed to be trained. And, uh, and my parents were very good Christians, so they helped teach me because they were telling other people about Jesus. And so I would see them uh, as an example for me. Um, and then as I went into college, I went to Bible college, and I had people that actually taught me more and more and more. And so what I'm wanting to do is teach you. And I know many of you, you already know. And you've, you've taught to, you talk to people about Jesus all the time. But this is just one way in which you can help other people understand the gospel. Okay, so these pictures, I'm, they're just pointing to something. There's nothing powerful in the picture. Okay, they're just to, to try and help us understand the gospel more uh, clearly. Okay, so uh, what I'm calling this uh, series of sermons that we're going to go through this summer is it's going to be called Go, which just means gospel out. Good news, we need to take it out to the world. We don't need to hold on to it and keep it. Okay, we've talked about this before, but the word gospel means good news. And I don't know if you, if you remember I mentioned, you know, if we had the cure for cancer, that would be really good news, wouldn't it? For people who have cancer, if we had a cure, um, and I talked about this, if it was in a little pill and we had it, it would be very selfish of us if we had it never to share it, right? If we had it, we just if I just kept it in my bag and I'm, I, I'm free of cancer, but I just keep it, no, I need to go share it. So we need to take the gospel out to other people. Okay, so the three main things that we're going to talk about over the next seven weeks are the words know, grow, and go. Okay, know just simply means if you know something, you understand it. Um, and I also talked about how the word know also means uh, to have a relationship with someone if you know them. We've talked about this. 
if once we become a child of God, we come to know Him personally and have a relationship with Him. So the gospel, the good news of Jesus is all about relationship, that God wants a relationship with you. He loves you. He wants you to talk to Him, and He wants to speak to you and, and uh, to know you. Okay, and then we'll talk about grow and go later. Grow, just how do we grow? Once we become a Christian and we know, come to know Jesus, how do we grow in our relationship with Him? And then how do we go? Share. And that's what we'll focus on as well. Okay, so I'm going to fly through these uh, slides. Sorry, these are some songs. Okay. Sorry, I have all these... Okay, so if you look in your booklet, we have the, uh, I'm just calling them the eight truths to understand the good news. Okay, now as we move through these, I'll, I'll explain what each of them mean. Uh, and today, we're just going to focus on these today. And then we're going to get into uh, where do we, how do we see this in the Bible? We're, we're going to look at all the Bible verses, but... You see these truths from Genesis to Revelation. And you'll see this as I begin to explain this. When you read the Bible, you'll look at the things that we talk about today, these truths, and you'll see them. You'll, you'll begin to... They'll stick out to you in your mind when you read the Bible. But we have to understand these truths to understand the good news, which ultimately is all about Jesus and what He did through His death and resurrection. Okay, so I'm just going to go through today, and if you want, like I said, if you if you have a pen, um, you can take notes, and you can write the little Bible verses uh, on the side. Uh, in fact, if we need to, are there pens in there, boys? Does anybody know what the word standard means? Yeah, so if you take a test in school, then you have to get a certain standard to pass the test, right? Um, so, I mean, I don't know in your countries how they grade you. Where, where I'm from, they give you, it's called an A, a B, a C. You have the same? Okay. And so you have to get certain levels to, to meet that standard? Okay, well, God... He Himself is the standard for all that is good and all that is loving. God is the greatest example of love and of righteousness and goodness. Okay? So, the word standard just means uh, the one that we're trying to honor and the highest standard to achieve. Okay? All right, so does everybody have pens? Okay, so I'm going to go through these really fast, okay? So just, it's like you're in school. I, this, I actually teach this at a Bible college. Um, there's a Bible school here that started last year, and they had me teach there, and I taught this. So I'm, you guys are taking a Bible course right now over the next seven weeks. So if someone said, did you go to Bible college Bible, Bible or Bible institute or school? You can say yes, <laughs> through with my pastor. Okay, so part of, the, part of that is <laughs> sometimes the, the teacher will talk really fast and you just take notes, and then you go back and you have to think about it. Okay, and it's all, I have it video, I'm videoing it, so you can go back and watch it if you want to write down the Bible verses, and I can give them to you later. Okay, so we're going to go through this really fast. Okay, all right, we're going to just read through the scripture. Uh, I have three or four Bible verses for each truth. Okay, so I have it in your language up here, and if you want to just write down the reference uh, where it's found in the Bible next to the picture, then you can go back and and uh, read through it, you know, maybe meditate on it later. Okay, and I will sit down so that you can see, because my head is in the way. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to go through and explain, okay? Let's read Revelation 4.11. It says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Okay? So, 
if you see that, if you want to write down Revelation 4.11, and you can go back and, can, and read that, okay? And I'm going to explain what this is talking about. It says, God is worthy to receive honor and glory and power. Okay, so what does the word honor mean? Okay? It means respect, or the main word, it means priceless. Something that's very valuable. You honor what you value. You respect, you love, you're willing to obey whatever or whoever you value the most. So I have in here, think about this in a relationship. Who in your life do you value that relationship above anyone else? Some of you, maybe your children or your spouse who you're married to. Some of you are not married yet. So maybe your sister or your brother or your mom or your, your dad. The relationship that you value the most, you're going to honor that person. And God deserves the highest honor of any relationship and of anyone or anything. I also have in there, who do you trust in the most for your eternal life, for your peace? That's the one that you will honor the most. Okay? So, honor, just think about what you value the most or what is priceless to you. Uh, okay, let's continue. We're going to talk about this word a lot over this course of the time, this word glory. I've been doing a lot of studying on this, and it means a lot. Uh, and we see this all throughout the Scripture about the glory of God. Okay, the glory, glory means beauty, not just like, uh, you know, if a man sees a woman and she's very pretty and he says, you're beautiful. That's one aspect of beauty. Okay, now I tease my wife, because when our sons were babies, she would say, oh, he's so beautiful. And I'd be like, no, he's not. He's a boy. He's handsome. Boys are handsome. Girls are beautiful. But of course, the word beauty can mean more than just outward. It's all of who someone is, how, how wonderful they are. Okay. Um, it means fame, uh, honor, to be full of something or weight or heaviness. And I'm going to explain what this means by weight. Okay? Now, this is a scale. This is kind of an old... We don't really use these kind of scales anymore. Do they in your country? Do they use them to weigh things? Okay. So, a scale is... Uh, you actually have... I, I, learned, I didn't put this in the PowerPoint, but I was reading about... In order to decide the weight of something, originally um, there was a, a block of weight that I believe was one kilo in France, and it was called the standard weight. It was the weight in which all other weights are measured by. So if someone has, say, this glass, and they go, I want to see how much it weighs... They have to put something on the other side of the scale to, to make it balance. Okay? Well, the standard weight in France, I don't know what they call this, uh, but they had it in France. It's, it, it's different now the way that they do scales because we don't balance things this way. We have different, we, have, we even have digital scales. Like if you want to weigh yourself and see how much you weigh, you stand on a scale, right? And it just shows up and you trust that it's right. And many times you're like, that has to be wrong, right? <laughs> what is the standard to measure it by? But this kind of weight, the glory of God is the standard by which we, we should measure everything else. So when we want to know what is good, we have to look at it compared to what, who God is. Okay? If we want to know if something is bad, we have to look at it compared to who God is in His very nature. So God's glory is called the weight of who He is. Okay, for example, um, if we were to weigh, we cannot weigh God's, uh, His love or His justice. Justice means Him being fair and giving what is deserved. So when we do wrong, we deserve to be put to shame, dishonored, and separated from God. That's what the Bible teaches, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. 
Okay? His goodness, His righteousness, God is perfect. Every time uh, we do something wrong, it kind of, uh, when we compare it to, to the righteousness of God, God's righteousness is His, His perfection. He, he never makes a, mis- a, a mistake. He never sins. He never does wrong. But we do right. So if we weighed, if we could put all of who God is on a scale and how good He is, okay? It's, it weighs a whole lot more than our goodness. Okay? So if I said, who's better at um, doing miracles? Me or God? Who would hold more weight? God. Because He does miracles. I cannot. So His weight, His glory is more full than mine. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? And you'll begin to start seeing this. This is something new I'm learning. I went to Bible college and I didn't learn this in Bible college. It's just me studying and reading and praying and looking at Scripture. Okay, so God is more full. See how it's full? He's, he's, he's more love than I am. He has more perfect love than I have. He has more perfect uh, righteousness. He, his good deeds far outweigh mine. So God's glory, when it said, we just read the Scripture in Revelation, it said He deserves all honor and glory because He is better and He deserves the highest honor because of who He is. Okay, so we'll continue. I know I'm having to go fast. Okay, let's look at, again, Revelation 4. Worthy is He to receive glory and honor and power. It says, for you created all things. So God, who is our Creator, because of who He is, He deserves the highest honor and respect and love. He should be the most valuable to us. Okay? Psalm 145.17 says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. That just means God is perfect. We are not, but God is perfect. He never does anything wrong. Okay? And uh, I know you're writing. So write Psalm 145.17. And I'm going to move on. Okay? And if you have questions, I can go back and share these with you later. All these scriptures. Okay? Deuteronomy 32, 3-4 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice. That means they're right. Everything God does is right and fair. Okay? A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. That means without sins, without doing wrong things, without breaking His commands. Just and upright is He. So God, also within God's righteousness, who He is, He not only does right, but He also punishes wrong. This is part of God's nature. You know, there's people out there that say, oh, God is loving. He would never send anyone to hell. He would never punish anyone for sin. God just loves everyone. Well, He does love everyone, but He also is a righteous God and He's perfect and He demands Righteousness and obedience. Okay? Alright, so let's move on. I know I'm going fast. Okay? Now, this leads to the... If you turn the page to the next picture, this picture represents the Ten Commandments. And you can see there's like a little crack in them. So it represents that the commands of God are broken. Okay? So let's look. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Remember, glory means the full weight of who God is. We fall short of who God is. If, If we weigh all of our good deeds and all of our good works and the way that we honor God, we fall short of perfection because we don't always honor God. Right? So let me, let's go back to the uh, scale. So because we've broken God's commands, our righteousness, our goodness does, is not, does not hold up. It doesn't weigh very much. Some people, they actually think, um, some, some parts of Islam, some people that uh, are Muslims, they actually believe this, 
that uh, God has th- this big scale in heaven and He's weighing their, their, their own good versus their own bad. Not against God, but against themselves. And they think, well, my good works are weighed on one side and my bad works are weighed on the other side. And if, I ha- if my good works weigh more than my bad works, then I'm in he- I get to go to heaven. I- I'm, a- I'm good. But that's not how the scale works. Okay, it's not our good versus our bad. It's our good versus God's good. Notice I put an extreme amount of a weight difference here. Because we break God's commands, uh, we'll look at the next scripture. It says we dishonor God. And so our goodness does not weigh very much. If you could put everything we do that's good in a big bucket, a big bowl, (laughs) And then you put all of who God is. I mean, his. I mean, this scale would be like tipped all the way up. See, that's why I put ten trillion kilos. I mean, we don't compare. Our goodness does not compare to God. Okay, so sin, sin is just revealing who we are. This is apart from Jesus. Okay, now we're going to get to the good news that Jesus actually balances the scale. Because He is righteous. He has all the glory of God. And He's willing to substitute that for us, okay? So I know, again, I'm going fast, but I'm just giving you an overview today. And then the next several weeks, we'll slow down and we'll actually look at it and talk about it. And I'll give you some more thing, print little booklets and stuff to be able to see, okay? So this is just an overview. So sin is falling short. So 10 kilos is, is, if you weigh it, is much less than 10 trillion. So our glory, our goodness, our, our righteousness, the things that we do, don't compare to God. Okay? Um, Romans 2.23 says, You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. So when we break God's commands, we do not honor Him. We're not showing that He is the most valuable to us. We're actually taking, if God, the Bible compares, uh, says that God is, the, is on the throne of His kingdom. He's the king. When we sin, we're basically saying, God, I want your crown on my head and I want to be my own God and do. I want to honor myself and my own desires. So when we break God's commands, we dishonor Him. Okay? So... Um, I'm not going to go through all these and explain all of them, but we've talked about this before. I know many of you have come from countries where the first two commandments, like I was mentioning earlier, God says, have no other gods except me. Do not even make anything, an image, a statue, anything, and bow down and worship it. Okay? Now, if we're honest with ourselves, if we look through these commands... We have broken these and we've dishonored God. And the scripture says, I don't have have it up here, but it says in Romans 3, 19 and 20, it says God's law, His commands were given. It says uh, in, in Romans 3, 20, no one will be justified, will be made right with God by obeying these commands. But these commands were given to reveal sin. So by, by works of the law, no human being will be justified since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So God gave us these commands to just show us how we dishonor Him. Okay? And we're going to get to the, uh, the good news that Jesus keeps all of those commands. Okay? Isaiah 53, 6. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way. And then we'll talk about the second half in a minute. And, and the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Jesus took our sins. All the ways that we dishonor God, Jesus took that dishonor on Himself and that shame. Okay, so if you want to just write down that Scripture, it says... Everyone has turned to his own way. You know, there's a lot of people that say, I'm a good person. I'm good. I don't need Jesus. 
The Bible says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one good, not even one. So every single one of us, in some way, if we look at the Ten Commandments, we've broken those commands in different ways at different times. So we all have sin. Okay, so now we're moving on to shame. If you turn to the next page, uh, how am I doing on my time, boys? <laughs> They're timing. <laughs> okay, so shame. Um, I didn't put the definition of shame up here, but shame means to... Uh, to lose face or to turn one's face away. So when we're ashamed of something or someone or something that we've done, it's like we kind of want to hide when people find out, right? We want to turn our face away. And so from God, sin leads to shame. To dis Shame also means to uh, dishonor. Okay? And um, we'll look at these scriptures and see how we see shame. It says, all worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship Him, all you gods. So what, what God is saying, this is in the, in the Psalms, that people who worship idols, you know this, you're worshiping an object that has no power. It's just an idol. It's, it's, an, it's an image. It was made by a person. We should worship the Creator, not worship what is created. And so God is saying, hey, people who worship idols, apart from Jesus, if they don't come to Jesus, they will be put to shame. Okay? Let's keep going. I'm sorry I'm going so fast. Okay, Isaiah 41.11 Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. These are very strong words of the Bible, warnings to us. If we dishonor God, this is what we deserve. Now, praise God, we're going to get to the good news in a minute, that Jesus took all the shame, He took all the punishment, all the separation, all the dishonor that we deserve. But apart from Jesus, every person, this is what we deserve. Sin always leads to shame. When we value our own desires above God, it never, it never works out well for us. It only leads to shame. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next verse. Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living water. So we talked about this in John chapter 4, how he told the woman at the well, come to me and drink. You'll never be thirsty again. Come to me. I got, I'm the one who gives eternal life. Right? And this says if those who turn away from Jesus, the living water, they'll be put to shame. Okay? All right. Last verse from on shame. Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. What the, we talked about this in John chapter uh, 5. How he said that he, those of us who have believed in him, on the day of judgment, our bodies will rise when, Je when Jesus returns the, the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 4, the dead in Christ will rise first. So we who believe in Jesus, we will rise and have an, a, be given a new body and we, we have eternal life. We talked about that last week, a relationship with God that continues on. So those who trust in Jesus have, rise on the day, the, in the last day of judgment. Right at the return of Christ. And then at the end of what's called the millennial kingdom, on the day of judgment for unbelievers, people who have died, who went to, their spirits are in hell, their bodies will actually rise, their spirit will rise. Okay? They will be given a judgment of shame. 
And we'll see in just a minute of being separated from God in what's called the lake of fire. This is all called the, it's the bad news. This is not the gospel. But we have to understand this before we'll understand the good news. Think about it again. My son's showing me a timer in the back. <laughs> Thank you, son. That actually helps. <laughs> okay, so now I lost my train of thought, son. Where'd you go? <laughs> okay, but this is saying those who, who do not turn to Jesus in faith, because we've all dishonored God, we deserve to be put to shame on the day of judgment and ultimately separated from God. Okay, so let's move on. To separation. And of course, as you look at the pictures, they kind of show you there's a separation between God who deserves to be honored and we've, we've dishonored Him and so we're put to shame. He, notice his, his face is turned away. So we'll look at this verse, Isaiah 59.2 But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. So this is shame and, and think about when, when we talk about separation, relational separation from God. So as believers in Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we are children of God. We do not have a relational separation between us and God. We have a perfect relationship with God because of Jesus. A husband and wife that are in perfect relationship. Okay, there's no separation Okay, but then, of course, things happen in our relationships here on this earth that can hinder that relationship. And the same with God. Our sins put this relational separation. Okay, so moving on to the next verse. Ezekiel 14, 7 through 8. For any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face. Okay, sorry, I'm going to skip down. Uh, verse 8, And I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people. So God is saying, every single one of us deserve to be cut off from the people of God, from the family of God as we talked about last week in John 10, from the sheepfold of God. This is what we deserve. But praise God, because of His grace, He gives us what we do not deserve through Jesus, if we will come to Jesus. Okay? So we have to understand the bad news before the good news because it helps us understand. Oh, I remember what I was going to say before my son <laughs> put the clock up. Okay? That... If I have the cure for cancer, but you do not have cancer, it's good news to you. You're like, yeah, that's good news. But it's really good news to the person who knows they need the cure the most, right? Mm -hmm. So the good news of Jesus, when we recognize this is what we deserve from God, we deserve shame, we deserve to be separated from God, and then Jesus comes along and He takes all of that away, and He in went through it for us, Wow, the gospel is really good news to us, isn't it? Because we know, oh, I am a sinner. I deserve this. But Jesus loves me so much, He was willing to take that away. And He took that at the cross. Okay, so... Uh, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So a wage is something you get paid and the Bible says here we deserve death. That word death also means separation. So we deserve separation from God. Okay? Relationally, physically, we deserve to be separated from God. Okay? And the last one for separation, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8-9. Uh, this, is, this is actually talking about, it's a horrible, at the day of judgment, those who reject Jesus... What happens? It says, in a flaming fly, in fire, this is at Jesus when He returns and brings judgment, in a flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God 
and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Notice the word glory. So God's justice is part of His glory. God is fair and will always punish sin. Either Jesus took the punishment for you and you accept that He did that and you turn to Jesus and follow Him as your Lord, or you have to take the full weight, the glory of His punishment. And the punishment is to be separated from Him. Notice, eternal destruction in a flaming fire. Hell, hell and, and, and the lake of fire is real. Some people say, oh, I, I don't want to talk about hell. Okay, now nobody wants to think about it, but Jesus loves us so much, He was willing to die and take this. Okay, so I got I to gotta go fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, substitution. A substitute is someone who takes the place of someone else. Okay, so how did Jesus take our place and what we deserve? Okay, Isaiah 53, 6, we already looked at this. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity, again, it means to, to trespass or go against God's law, to break His commands, okay, to dishonor Him. So the, it says the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sins. This is a prophecy from Isaiah 53, looking ahead to Jesus who would take our sins on Himself. Okay? I'm sorry, I, ha I have to go through these because they're so fast. Okay? Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus knew when He was going to die on the cross. He knew that we deserve to be put to shame and we deserve to be separated from God in hell and the lake of fire. And because of His love, it says He despised the shame. He was like, you know what? If I die on this cross, I'm going to be put to shame and I'm going to be separated from God the Father. And He said, you know what? I'm willing to do that. It says, for the joy set before Him. You know what the joy, God's joy that brought Him joy is to bring glory to the Father because He loves us. It brought Jesus joy to die for us. That's good news for us, isn't it? That He loves us so much He was willing to go through everything that we deserve. Okay? Again, we're going fast. It's getting hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay? Now, substitution, this is, this is all the gospel, the good news. And next week, we're going to focus just on this part, the, the gospel, the good news, okay? It says, uh, we already went through this, but I wanted to put it up here in another sermon. Matthew 27, 46, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So when Jesus was dying on the cross, he was being separated relationally from his father. And he was taking all the shame and the sin and the judgment and the punishment and the wrath of God, as the Bible says. He was taking all of it. There's no more left for you. If you trust Jesus, there's no shame. You will not be put to shame. You will not be separated from God. That's good news, isn't it? Because Jesus went through that for us. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So Jesus, who is righteous, He's perfect. He died for us who are not perfect, we're unrighteous, to bring us to God, to bring us into relationship with God. Okay, so I'm going to show this with the illustration on the scale again. So, if our good works are weighed compared to, uh, to God's good works, 
Okay? God's glory is more full than ours. His, his righteousness, His goodness. Okay? But here's what Jesus does for us. This is where the good news comes in. Jesus becomes or is treated as though He's not righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, Jesus knew, He, he never sinned. He didn't know sin. He, he never did it. He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus was treated as though He had sin. He was treated as though His glory was less than the Father. He was treated as though He broke all the commands. He was treated that way, okay, so that we could become the righteousness of God. Okay, so here's what happens. So Jesus balances the scale. Okay, so if God is perfectly righteous and full of all goodness and love and perfection, okay, and the Bible says our sin has made this separation between us and God. Like the scale doesn't balance. Okay? But Jesus, through His perfect life, I wrote this up here. We're going to talk about this next week more, okay? His perfect life, His death, and His resurrection, it balances the scale so that through the cross and the resurrection, here's what happens. We, people, you and I, guess what happens? The scale is balanced. The glory of, of God that He requires for relationship with Him, to, to honor God, God requires that we honor Him to be in relationship with Him. And we can't honor Him on our own. We cannot be perfectly righteous. But Jesus has the full weight, the full <laughs> measure of the glory of God. And so He balances that for us and He gives us his righteousness, His glory. So when God looks at you, God looks at you as though you are perfectly honored, even though we don't deserve to be honored by God. Right? We don't deserve it, but God gives it to us. Jesus gives it to us. So this is good news. So Jesus balances the scale of righteousness and honor. Okay? We don't. A lot of people will go, oh, well, since I'm a sinner, then I need to become a better person, and then maybe the scale will balance and God will be happy with me. You'll never measure up. I'll never measure up to the full weight of the glory of God. My glory, my righteousness, my goodness, I'll never honor God fully, right? That's why we need Jesus, because He, he makes us right with God, okay? Um, let me... Keep moving, sorry. Which leads to the next truth, saving faith. So what does a person need to do to receive the glory of God and be righteous? They need to have faith, saving faith. Okay, and I'm going to go through this really quick. We've talked about this verse. We've been singing this verse. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. That word justified means declared righteous. God is righteous. We're unrighteous. But when we come to faith in Jesus, God calls us righteous. He gives us Jesus' clean record. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I've talked about this, and that He's the only Lord, that Jesus is God. Not just uh, someone you follow as your master, but as your God. Follow Him as the Lord, God. We talked about this from John 8. Follow Him as Yahweh, Jehovah from the beginning. Jesus is Jehovah. He's part of the triune God. Father, Son, and Spirit, all part of Jehovah, Yahweh. Right? Or the th one of the three persons of God. So we must confess that Jesus is Lord. It says, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you will be saved. Now notice verse 11. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. 
This is talking about on the day of judgment. When we stand in front of God, you will not be put to shame. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Okay, now apart from Jesus, we have a lot to be ashamed of because we've dishonored God in many ways. We've disobeyed Him in many ways. But Jesus covers our sin and He gives us His clean, righteous, honorable life as a free gift. And He says if we believe in Him, we'll never be put to shame. That's good news, isn't it? Okay? Um, we're still on saving faith. Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. So again, this is just saying God gives us His perfect righteousness. The glory of God is given. Not the full measure of the glory of God. We don't become gods. But we receive the righteousness of God. We're not treated as though we've dishonored Him. Okay? I know I'm having to go so fast through these. Next week we're slowing way down. Okay? So you don't feel like, oh, no, 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 he's going so fast. Okay? So again, Jesus balances the weight. He gives us His righteousness because Jesus is perfect, just like God the Father. It balances. You measure Jesus' love and His justice and His goodness and His righteousness to the Father, and it's the same. Perfectly balanced. And Jesus gives that to us who believe in Him and trust and follow Him as the Lord. Okay, sorry, this is... The last verse here, John 1.12, But to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So, in relationship with God, when we come to believe in Jesus, we God doesn't just make our standing with Him in heaven right. He actually gives us a relationship with Him. Because God is relational, right? He wants to know you and to be known by you. And salvation, we're almost done, okay? Salvation it mean, just means to be saved or rescued, okay? Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel, of the good news that Jesus... That Jesus balances the weight. He has the glory of God. Okay? I mentioned this last week. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that Jesus uh, has shined His light, the truth, in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So Jesus has the glory of God. He's the one that makes us righteous. He's the one that saves us. He gives salvation to us. Look, to everyone who believes. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what caste you're from, what family you were born in, what you've done. If you put your faith in Jesus and believe on Him as your Lord, you can have salvation. Okay? Isaiah 45, 17, But Israel is saved by the Lord. With everlasting salvation, you shall not be put to shame or confounded for all of eternity. So there is no shame for those who, who trust Jesus. Isaiah 45, 24, Only in the Lord it shall be said of me are righteousness and strength. To Him shall come and be ashamed all who are against Him. So again, I'm just showing you, there's lots of Bible verses that are teaching these truths that I'm showing you. And then we're going to slow down and actually next week, you know, go through. Okay? So, we are righteous. Oh, it says, only in the Lord can it be said of me a righteousness. I'm not righteous on my own. I'm not good on my own. I'm not going to heaven because I do good things. I'm going to heaven because Jesus is good and He's given me His righteousness. Amen? Amen. And you too, not just me. I'm saying me. <laughs> Making sure you're awake. <laughs> okay, we're almost done, I promise you. Okay, I don't know why this keep... I accidentally uh, put this in there again. Okay, uh, just write this verse down. I'm not going to read it all. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. The main point um, that I want to make here 
This is the very last chapter of the Bible talking about the future after the final judgment. How those of us who know Jesus, Jesus is going to make a new earth and put heaven on that earth, right? And we get to go live there with Him. There's no death, no shame, no separation from God. We'll, we'll be perfect in our new immortal bodies. And if you, if you read on down, it says in verse 4, they will see His face. Now shame means to turn one's face away, right? God says your iniquities have turned His face away from you. But in Jesus, we will look at God's face. He will never turn His face away from us. Okay? And then it goes on, verse 5, and says, And night will be no more. They will, need, they will not need the light of, the, of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So God will actually honor us in His kingdom, and we will actually, to reign in a kingdom means to, to lead with God. We'll actually reign with God over His creation. The Bible says we will, we will rule the angels in His kingdom. Many people think, oh, angels are way up here and we're down here. No! In Christ, the angels are our servants. We don't serve them. Okay, so, sorry. And I'm going to move on to the last point, sanctification, which just simply means in Jesus, now God gives us the power to, to love Him the way that we should love Him, to honor Him the way that we should honor Him, and also to suffer for Him. The, notice the cross in there. God says that we will suffer for Jesus. He will give us the, the, the strength and the power to endure. Sanctification means to be set apart for God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. So God does not look at you after you put your faith in Jesus. God does not look at you the way that He used to before. You, God does not call you a sinner. Did you know this? We're called saints. If you follow Jesus, God does not identify you as a sinner. Even though we are sinners, we do we do sins. You're a saint. You know, uh, in some churches, you know, like the Orthodox churches and stuff. Oh, the saints are the people with their pictures on the walls who were really good people. No, saints are those who follow Jesus in faith. You and I are saints. We're not waiting to die to become a saint. We're, God calls us saints now. Okay? I'm going to continue because we're, we're a new creation. We're a new person in Christ. Okay? 2 Corinthians 3.18 We're going to spend a whole week just on this one passage. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit actually transforms us. It says from one degree of glory to, to the other. Notice it's the glory means the weight and the full measure and the goodness of who God is. Jesus balances the scale for us and gives us His glory. And then now as Christians... We're being transformed into the way God already sees us. Even though we're not perfect right now, we don't fully look like Jesus all the time. We're not always righteous. God looks at us and treats us as though we are righteous. And He is transforming us into who He already sees us to be. So when God looks at you right now, this is part of the gospel, the good news. He looks at you the way that He will look at you for all of eternity in heaven. He looks at you as He only honors you. You have been given the place of honor. So think about like in your caste systems and you have all this. God has put you in the place of honor. He already sees you the way He will see you for all of eternity. But now in this life, He's transforming us. And that's a process, and sometimes it's hard, okay? Second Timothy 2.2 2 says, 
and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. I'm sorry, I put the wrong scripture there. Um, it's supposed that that's the wrong scripture. Um, I'll have to go back and look at the reference. It says, "You will suffer for him for a little while." And your suffering is transforming you into the same image of Jesus. So the process of sanctification is, is becoming more like Jesus. Okay, so I know I just went through that. Like I said, it's like Bible college where they just throw it at you and you're like, your brain feels like, oh no, what just happened? So the next six weeks, uh, we will slow down. We'll look at this and then... We'll take uh, some weeks where we're actually going to break up in groups and we're going to talk about how would you, if you meet someone on the street and they say, how can I become a Christian? How can I know God? How can I know that when I'm going to die, I'm going to go to heaven? I want you to be able to have some tools like this to where you can just show them from pictures or in your own way where you can share with them. Of course, you're not going to share all that. That was way too much. But this just gives you a big picture of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. All of us need it because we all we all have shame. We all have things we've done wrong, right? And so we all need Jesus. And so we need to share that and go and tell others. Okay? Alright. Boys, I'm done. What's the time? <laughs> Six. How much? One hour and two minutes. An hour and two minutes. I, I told him I could do it in one hour. What did you say, Elijah? One hour and three minutes. One hour and three minutes. Elijah said one hour and five minutes. What did you say, Noah? I can't hear you. You said exactly one hour. Oh, okay, so. What did you say? An hour and 25 minutes. <laughs> oh, my. What did Elise say? One hour and two minutes. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Pastor, I oh, want yes. to ask something. You teach about the judgment day. We, we all are standing in front of the God. The yeah. book of Revelation telling about one book, angel bringing in this opening. What do you call that English, that name book? Yes, yeah, so in Revelation chapter 20, we looked at 22. Um, it says the book of works were open. Two books. Yeah. Two books were open. One, the book of works. So the, God's basically weighing at the judgment our righteousness. And he looks in the book and the book of works, the things that we have done. He's weighing that against himself. Okay, so those of us who trusted Jesus, Jesus balanced the scale and gave us his if, if God looks at Jesus' book, stacked up of only good, righteous, glorious things, so Jesus balances the scale. And so God, it says some, the books were opened, and some were judged according to everything written in the book, and they were cast into the lake of fire. That's those who rejected Jesus, because their good works don't balance out. They don't, they don't measure up to the righteousness of God. Okay, and it says, and the book of life, the book of life was opened and everyone whose name was written in the book of life went on to everlasting uh, life. Okay, so if you have put your faith in Jesus, this is very hard for us to understand. The Bible says our name was written in the book of life before God created the earth. God exists outside of time, right? So God knew. He, he knew who would believe on Him. He know, we're, we're called the chosen people of God. He knows who are His chosen, those who would come to faith in Him, and He wrote our names before He created the earth. That's crazy to think about, isn't it? Yeah, like did. God knew you thousands of years ago. And, you're, and He wrote your name in that book and then on the day of judgment, he will look and your name will be in that book. Your name will be all of you who have trusted Christ. Your name will be in that book. And God won't judge you according to the book of works because Jesus took, took the, the, the full way and was dishonored by God. I mean, he was dishonored, not by God. He was, he was put to shame. 
And, but he was separated from, from God. By, God actually separated himself from Jesus because that's what the punishment was. So The separation starting from the talking about the book of uh, Genesis from Eve and Adam. This is the beginning. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And shame when they when they took from the fruit. Um, it doesn't use the word shame, but it said as soon as they ate, they looked down and they realized they were naked. So they were ashamed like all of a sudden, they were exposed and they knew something was wrong. They knew they had sinned, so they try to cover themselves, mm-hmm. right, on their own. Like we do this nowadays, we try to cover our own shame. Like, oh, I'll try to become a better person, or I don't want anyone else to find out what I just did, and so then maybe I'll be okay. But God sees everything, Pastor right? Just what he just similar like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like when your kids. Uh, or, or when you were a child, you know, sometimes you would sneak and do something like I would take cookies, you know, without asking and from because <laughs> my mom would not let me eat cookies because of the sugar all the time. So, you know, that was me sneaking. Oh, no one will find out. I told the boys this one time. My parents went to this house um, when I was like four years old to buy the house and we were looking at it. And the, this teenager had a donut on a plate. You know what a donut is? It's like a round piece of bread with sugar on it. And I was walking in the basement and I saw the donut on the plate and no one was there and I took a bite out of it. And I was like, no one will see. <laughs> I never heard anything, but I know that that kid, he, w- he, you know, he probably went to his room and then he came back and he was like, Oh no, my donut! Someone took a bite out of it because it was perfectly round. Because yeah. <laughs> I thought nobody will see. Uh, you know, I did. I wasn't a Christian. I was four. I, I hadn't accepted Jesus. I didn't know. I didn't. I knew it was wrong, but I, I was just like nobody will see me. <laughs> but anyways, well, let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you and we praise you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, we we thank you for the gospel, Lord. And I know I went through this stuff so fast, stuff that you've taught me, Lord, and um, I just pray that you would help us to begin to understand these truths, Lord, and be able to explain to others, Lord, the good news is just about you, Jesus. We don't have to explain all these things to people, but, but Jesus, you are the Lord, and you died, and you rose again, and you're the one who makes us right with you, not ourselves, Lord, only you, and we thank you, Jesus, you were willing to take our shame. You are willing to be dishonored. You are willing to be punished and take the separation from your Father that we deserve. And you say you did that for the glory of God and and for your love for us.